Thank you for being with us uh, this Sunday morning. Just special shout out to those of you who might be a guest with us. If you're looking for a home church, we have a saying around here. Uh, we believe you found it. We have culture course that's immediately happening after this service. And we'd love to get you connected and, and make some friends here at, uh, at Faith. Uh, we've been in a series called uh, social struggles, social struggles. We've been talking about some hard topics. We've been talking about betrayal. Uh, how many of us have ever felt betrayed before, right? Like maybe you've gone through some things. I don't know if you've ever felt overlooked. We talked about being overlooked and forgotten about and people not recognizing us and, and kind of looking for value throughout life. And, and the whole purpose of this series circulates around this one big idea, and it's this, allow adversity with people to grow you personally with God. Allow adversity with people to grow you personally with God. Because here's what I want us to capture. Our great relationships will come with adversity in them, right? That, that we're not always on the mountaintop experience. We're not always in the, the, uh, the rainbows and the unicorns and the cotton candy, as my dad would say. That life gets messy. And I would encourage you, through your relationships, not to run away from the adversity, but to lean in and allow God to grow you through those seasons and in those relationships. Today, we are talking about the adversity of confrontation. The adversity of confrontation. Uh, how many of us, you like to have hard conversations with people? No, don't even raise your hands, right? Like, all of us are like, man, I got to I got to have that hard conversation. I'm a huge people pleaser, and it hurts me to my core to address something with people that I know I ought to address. I hate it. I can't stand it. I lose sleep at night. I whine to my wife, and she's like, either you handle it or I will. And I'm like, but you don't understand. I don't want to confront. Confrontation is part of life. Confrontation is a part of of relationships. It's been said, if we can learn how to address issues head on, we can build stronger bonds. If we can learn how to do it in a healthy manner, you can have some of the greatest relationships that you're searching for, that you long for, that you want in life. Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 18, verse 15. It says, if your brother, and I want you to circle this word brother, underline it if you're taking notes, because it'll come into context a little bit later throughout our message this morning, is this. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens, you have gained your brother. Understand this, that you've gained a sacred friendship. Yet so many times I see it happen over and over and over again, specifically with us church folk. We are terrible. We're sissies when it comes to just having some blunt conversations with one another, in a loving way, that is. Here's some major reasons we struggle to have some real, con uh, some, some confrontation. One, we have fear of conflict. Man, if I, if I address this issue, it's going to lead to bigger issues. Like if you're a parent in the room and you got a teenage daughter and you're sitting there like, ooh, I don't like that outfit, but I know if I say something to my daughter, she is going to come back storming and attitude all over her and say, oh, dad, you just don't know what's in style anymore. And you're like, dude, I don't want to have that conversation. So you don't say anything. Fear of conflict. We, we get scared that the issue is going to get bigger. Maybe fear of conflict. If I say anything to my wife about how much she buys on Amazon, <laughs> guess what might not happen at night? You know what I'm saying? I'm like, fear of conflict, bigger issues. Another one, avoidance of discomfort. Avoidance of discomfort. No one likes to be in one of those weird scenarios where it's like awkward. And we're like, dude, I don't want to confront because I don't want it to be awkward and feel uncomfortable. And then we do one of these things and we can't confront in a healthy way. So, so that person's in the room and, and we literally walk on the other side of the, the room and we're like, I'm not talking to them. No, nope, not at all. Because we want to avoid the discomfort. Nothing is comfortable about following Jesus, especially in this world. 
part of the most healthy thing you can do in your relationships is to embrace some of the uncomfortability that come throughout your relationships. That's why it's important today's message. I saved it for the last part of our, our social struggle series because confrontation is key in how we handle ourselves, how we grow deeper bonds, how we connect with people, how we represent Jesus in our community. And then the third major way is we lack communication skills. Why we don't confront is because simply we don't know how to have this face-to-face -face conversation. I know my old-timers are like, yeah, this generation now, like, all oh, they're doing, they're on their phones, and, you know, they text, they post. But, hey, let's be honest. Some of the most opinionated people are on Facebook, right? And Facebook typically pertains to an older group. Instagram, TikTok, younger group. But I, my point is, it's not ever been like an issue that hasn't ever existed. It's an issue that has always existed. That people struggle to communicate effectively with one another. Particularly when it comes to, hey, I need to address a serious issue. If you're married in this place, like, like you, you have to think and, and play it out and, and map it out in your mind so you can logically move through confrontation and you're trying to figure some of this out and, and it can be overbearing or, or sometimes you're just like, hey, you know what, I'm not just going to address it. But we lack to communicate effectively with one another and it, and it become major in, in our points of, of conflict. So we're coming to this, this moment in this story. But I, but, but I, I want to... Just stress to this, what the late Charles Spurgeon, great preacher, said, Satan greatly approves of our railing at each other, but God does not. So when we can understand how to properly and healthily handle confrontation in life with our adult kids, with our children, with our friends, at work, with our boss, in every area you're going to be able to have a stronger bond, not only with those relationships, but also with God. So I want us to lean in. We're continuing this story, looking at this life by the, name, by the man named of Joseph. Now, Joseph has been through it. Joseph has been through the ringer. You think your family is messed up? I say this every time we talk about Joseph. His family was messed up. Quick recap of where we find him at in his story. First, he was sold off at the age of 17, roughly, into slavery by some of his closest friends, his brothers. They didn't like him. He was dad's favorite. And so they're like, hey, we're done with you, Joseph. You get all the attention. We're through with you. Well, God intervenes time and time again throughout Joseph's story. There's this beautiful picture of God's providence and God's sovereignty. And we see this happening throughout Joseph's life where God would intervene and think people would make decisions. And Joseph is at this uh, person's house by the name of Potiphar. He gets wrongly accused. And then he gets put into prison. And he's in prison, and he's between prison and between slavery. He's in this, this, this long, hurting season of his life for 13 years. Now, you could pick up your Bible, and you could like read through it in 10 chapters or so, approximately, and read about his life. And you could probably do it maybe within 30 minutes to an hour's time. You're like, oh, that doesn't sound so bad. But can you imagine 13 years between slavery and prison? By the people that you trusted, by the people you cared for, by the people you loved, and yet wrongly accused. Well, God would work time and time in his life. And Joseph had this unique ability through God's blessing in his life to interpret dreams. And so we see these dreams happen each and every step of Joseph's life. And it comes to the point where the king by the name of Pharaoh is, is, gets this dream of seven scrawny cows and, and then seven very plump cows cows and and then seven like like scrawny things of grass and and weed of grass and then seven very like great enormous and so he gets called he calls joseph in because word gets back to pharaoh that this man could interpret dreams and so when joseph comes into pharaoh's court he interprets the dreams and he says this is what these dreams mean that there's going to be seven years of plenty and then there's going to be seven years of famine and so Pharaoh sees that God's spirit is upon his life. Pharaoh sees just how God is working. And, and, and I liked him when I look in the, the scriptures and I see how Pharaoh is working. Pharaoh was a genius. 
And I, and I like to think that there was some kind of unique, special moment that God had on Pharaoh's life in this season because he leaned into one of God's holy people in their lives. And so when we see this happening, because Joseph has this great favor of God, because Joseph has this unique ability to tell the uh, dreams, what we see happen is Pharaoh elevates him to be the second of command in all of Egypt. And Egypt was the powerhouse of the world back then. So we see this taking place. So he goes from being a slave to being in prison to now he's in the palace. Everyone comes and reports to Joseph next to Pharaoh. It's Pharaoh and then Joseph. So we see this mighty move of God in Joseph's life. And the story continues where confrontation appears and confrontation happens with some of the people that hurt him extreme so much in his life. Join me, Genesis 42, verse 3. We'll pick up this story, and we're going to be breezing through a few chapters this morning. So Joseph's ten older brothers went down to Egypt to buy grain. So they left the land of Canaan. They traveled approximately around 200 to 250 miles to go and buy grain. See, in, in, verse, in chapter 41, verse 57, we see, Moreover, all the earth came to Egypt. So we see this big setup that Joseph was having in his life, that the whole world was turning to Joseph and turning to Egypt. In verse 4, but Jacob, wouldn't let, but Jacob wouldn't let Joseph's younger brother Benjamin go with him, for there was fear some harm that would come to him. So Jacob's sons arrived in Egypt along with the others to buy food, for the famine was in Canaan as well. Since Joseph was governor of all of Egypt and in charge of selling grain to all the people, it was to him that his brothers came. When they arrived, they bowed, with, they bowed before him with their faces to the ground. So this dream that Joseph told his brothers that got him into slavery and got him sold off is coming to fruition right now. His brothers are bowing before him. Verse 7, Joseph recognized his brothers instantly, but he pretended to be a stranger, spoke harshly to them. And that word harshly sounds kind of... of uh, you know, not very bad right now, but harshly. Joseph probably has some, you know, words that, you know, he probably wouldn't be kissing mama with right here. Harshly to them. Where are you from? He demanded. From the land of Canaan, they replied, we have come to buy food. Although Joseph recognized his brothers, they didn't recognize him. These guys, Joseph, can you imagine having this confrontation with the people that sold him into slavery. He's processing it in real time. And he remembered the dreams he had about them many years before. He said to them, you are spies. You have come to see how vulnerable our land has become. And they go, no, my Lord, they exclaim. Your servants have simply come to buy food. We are all brothers, members of the same family. We are honest men, sir. We are not spies. So the confrontation is taking place. There's three big areas of confrontation. I want to pull us some observations on what it means to have healthy biblical confrontation, because when it comes to Joseph's story, Joseph next to Jesus lets and sets a standard for us to ideally strive for. So healthy biblical confrontation first is learned and does not come naturally. Healthy confrontation is learned and does not come naturally. I don't care what anybody says. You might think that, man, they can have any hard conversation. They can talk to anybody. They can, they just have those, those way with their words. No, at some point along the line, people learned how to interact with one another. It's learned when, when conflict arises is when we need to address and look at how we need to confront that conflict. I want to encourage you, there's a lot of ways that when and how we should confront, but you should never confront when the emotion is too escalated. You should never confront when, man, you're raging against the machine, you're angry, you're full, and you're like, whoo, 
boy, you know, set me back, you know, like that's not a healthy way to confront. You shouldn't confront if it's not your issue. If it's not your issue, don't, don't go poking your nose in someone else's issue. You shouldn't confront if it's a, a one-time offense. Man, now we live in a day and age where it's like someone says something wrong one time and, and let's cancel them. Let's get mad at them. Let's get like, oh man, like we get frustrated and we get angry and they're like, dude, they just said it one time. They made a mistake. Give them forgiveness. Give them grace, church. So we have to know when the right time to confront is. It's, it's part of learning. So when should I confront? I, I like to use this term of, of kind of a rule of three. A, a counselor says is, hey, if it happens the first time, hey, it happened the first time. If it happened the second time, then maybe take note of it and say, hey, this might be a pattern. Happens a third time, maybe you should then speak to that person about it. You know, notice it. Then it maybe is an accident. And then maybe it's time to speak. See, Joseph was always in this, uh, this, this figuring out. He's seeing his brothers. You know, it's been years. Emotion. He's overloaded. In, in Genesis 42, verse 17, this is what he does when he sees his brothers, and he put them all together in custody for three days. He goes, you put me in prison for a while, I'm going to at least give you a little taste, and it puts them in jail for three days. You know, a lot of times, it's, it's, he didn't know how to react at that moment. He didn't know what to do. He's like, hey, I love God. I'm in tune with God. I'm in touch with God. And I got these people who were my enemies who hurt me, and it was hard. He just needed some pause. You got to learn the pause in life. You got to learn to take the step back. You got to learn to relax. You got to learn that sarcastic remark is not saying anything about your identity. That that misuse of language was just supposed to be a joke. Don't take it the wrong way. Take a pause in life. And then in Genesis 42, verse 24, Joseph, he's around his brothers in this confrontation. And he says, then he turned away from them and he wept. He turned away from them and wept. This man, prestige, second in all of the land. Of, of Egypt doesn't want them to see him cry. Learning how to navigate your emotions is vital to being able to confront in a healthy way. Learning how to say, hey, I'm, I'm not going to say these kind of words, or I'm not going to get angry at this exact moment. I'm not going to cry in front of them. My boy is there, there seven and all the way down, and I have a seven-year-old, six-year-old, one on the way, green light, anytime. We're excited but when you're raising kids, one of the things that you're teaching them as a parent is how to navigate their emotions. Healthy ways. Hey, talk to me about how you're feeling. Talk to me when you're frustrated. Talk to me when you're hurting. Talk to me when you're confused. And a lot of times we don't want to learn how to navigate our emotions. We want to indulge our emotions. Jesus he gives us some steps of confrontation in Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 and 17. He says this, if another believer, we looked at the ESV translation earlier, if another believer or brother, I want to be very pointed here. There's different confrontation that should happen and take place with someone that knows Jesus and someone that doesn't know Jesus. Okay, I can't put the rules of the same thinking and my same morals and my same ethics and my same biblical background and perspective on someone that does not know Jesus. Why do I want to get mad at the world when they're far from Jesus, when they're far from God, and they don't know him, but yet I'm putting my standards upon them? You know who's going to get frustrated in that moment? Me. So when Jesus is talking here in Matthew chapter 18, he says, if another believer sins against you, it's this address for how we should handle brothers and sisters in, in the faith. If another believer sins against you, go privately and point out their offense. If the other person listens and confesses, you have won the person back. But if you are unsuccessful, 
take one or two with you and go back again so that everything you say may be confirmed between two or three witnesses. If the person still refuses to listen, take your case to the church. Then if he or she won't accept the church's decision, treat that person as a pagan or corrupt tax collector. It's very essential. Jesus is talking about how we conduct ourselves in the body. Three basic principles we pull from that text. One, we talk to people and not about people. I want us to understand that. We talk to people, not about people. This confrontation can happen. It's learned. Just because they're blood does not mean that they are exempt. Does that understand? Oh, they're my, they're my husband, they're my, they're my siblings, I'll, I'll let them get away with something, or I won't confront this issue because I don't want them to get mad at me, but I have no problem confronting people I don't really care about or know about or somebody else in, in a class or in a group. No. This is concept, practicality, all that Jesus is teaching. We talk to people, not about people. That means when your sister makes some mistake, you don't go to mom and dad and just complain and complain and complain. If your spouse makes a mistake, you don't go to your, uh, your parents and you just say, man, my spouse, they're so wrong, and da-da-da-da-da, and you go and you go and you go. No. We talk to people, not about people. Secondly, Jesus says, attack the issues and not people. Like, you don't got to bring up the whole the, the list of wrongs. I'm grateful whenever my wife and I, we, we have a nickname for our confrontations. We call them conversations. Hey, we need to have a conversation. I'm like, woo, confrontation, you know, conflict. And our number one rule whenever we engage with each other, whenever we talk about this, hey, is this the issue? Is this really what you're mad about? Help me bring clarity here. Is this what you're frustrated about? Okay, I get it. But don't, don't tell me about what happened the past three weeks because, yeah, you're right. Hopefully I already fessed up to them. You know, hopefully I'm already, uh, it's already been disputed and, and, and moved on from. And then Jesus says, and then Jesus gives us this, we accept the results and move forward. Gain a brother or treat him as a tax collector. Accept the results and move forward. Healthy biblical confrontation is learned. It does not come naturally. Learn how to navigate the emotions. Learn how to, to talk in the right time and take a pause. Learn how to just be cool, calm, and collected. Learn, learn, learn. Learn yourself. Secondly, healthy biblical confrontation is planned and will not just occur. It's planned and will not just occur. Confrontation isn't one of those things like, okay, I'm going to wake up today, maybe if I see him, maybe if I don't, just kind of go, no, like healthy confrontation is learned and planned for. Let's look at some of the major conflicts in scripture. We see in conflict with humanity, humanity sin. What's God do? He gives us the plan. Who's the plan? Jesus is the plan. That when we believe Jesus came and died on the cross for our sins, that God raised him from the grave and we confess that we are sinners, broken, far, depraved from God, and we accept Jesus as our Lord and leader in our life, we are saved. If you have a lot of conflict going on in your life, the first step I would encourage you to engage in, get right with Jesus. What's it mean to get right with Jesus except as the Lord, Savior, leader of your life? The only answer to fill that void and that gap in your life. So conflict. Jesus and God give us a plan. Conflict. Let me give you some other examples. There's this woman who's caught in adultery in John chapter 8. This is what Jesus does. He says, hey, calls the, the town together, calls, calls those who want to stone the lady and says, all right, you throw the stone if you've never sinned before. Pretty smart plan because no one's throwing those stones. We see another conflict happen. There's conflict throughout Scripture time and time again. There's this man by the name of the Scripture knows him as the rich, young, vain ruler. And he asks Jesus, what should I do to, uh, to inherit eternal life? And, and Jesus gives him a plan. He says, you got conflict in your life. you got a gap in your life. This is what I need you to do. Go and sell everything you have. Now, if you know the story, the rich young ruler, this vain, conceited man, couldn't do it. Struggled with it. Navigating conflict needs a plan. Handling confrontation, having hard conversation needs a plan. Joe has a plan with the conflict. In Genesis 42, verse 24, he regains his composure. He spoke to his brothers again. 
And then he chose Simeon, from whom was among them, and had him tied up right before their eyes. Now, Simeon they, is probably the, the biggest, baddest brother. He's huge. Back in Genesis 34, he was this guy that went and raided a whole village because his sister was assaulted. And, and when this happens, he goes and he basically kills all these dudes. He's a pretty bad dude. And so when the brothers see that Simeon is getting tied up, they're like, oh boy, we're scared now. Like, we're, like he's taking one of the biggest, baddest brothers, and this is what kind of power Joseph has. Joseph's having this plan. So this is what Joseph's plan continues on. He, Joseph sends his brothers back to Canaan, knowing they'll be back. They're in the first couple years of the famine, and then in Joseph's verse 25, Genesis, then he ordered the servants to fill them in sacks with grain, but he also gave secret instructions to return each brother's payment at the top of his sack. He also gave them supplies for their journey home. So the brothers loaded their donkeys with grain and headed for home. But when they stopped for the night, one of them opened his sack to get the grain for his donkey. He found his money in the top of his sack. Look, he exclaimed to his brothers, my money has been returned. It's here, for my sa- it's here in my sack. Then their hearts sank. They were trembling. They're like, dude, did we just steal from the most powerful guy in all of the land? You just imagine Joseph like, dude, I'm setting these guys up. They're going to be scared because he knows they're coming back. Remember, he's been told seven years, the first couple years. He's like, these guys are going to be sweating bullets because they're coming back. Planned, healthy, processed. Whenever you have confrontation that needs to happen in your life, it takes plan. Maybe you need to write out what you need to say. Maybe you need to set up boundaries on what needs to take place. Maybe you need to meet in a neutral site, not with other people. Maybe it just needs to be one-on-one. Maybe it needs to be spousals, spouse couples. Maybe it needs to happen with a boss, uh, with a coworker. Maybe it needs to happen a parent and parent and child, and child, or one-on-one. We got boy issues in my house. We got girl issues in my house. We play man-to-man in those scenarios. Wife handles the girl issues. Dad handles the boy issues. It's planned. I would encourage you, whenever you're having something that's taking place in your life that needs confronting, plan it out. Don't just throw it up to the wind to see if it can happen and occur. Thirdly, healthy biblical confrontation, it's learned, it's planned, it's vulnerable and trusting of God. It's vulnerable and trusting of God. So Joe's brothers, they come back. This time, Joseph says, hey, if you return, you need to bring your little brother back. It's his little brother. It's his full-blooded brother. It came from his mom, Rachel. So Benjamin's the favorite. Joseph's the favorite. Jacob is, thinks he has both of his sons that are kind of missed. So, so right now they're kind of like uh, suffocating Rachel and Jacob are kind of suffocating Joseph's little brother Benjamin because he's like the rightful heir, the favorite. But Joseph, knowing this background, says, no, you need to bring him back if you want to get Simeon out of jail. So Genesis 43, verse 18, the brothers were terrified when they saw that they would be taken into Joseph's house. It's because the money someone put in our sacks sacks last time we were here, they said. He plans to pretend that we stole, and then he will seize us, make us slaves, and take our donkeys. So let me give you just a quick, clear recap of what took place in these past couple chapters. They get the grain, sends them back home. They run out of grain, they have to come back. Simeon is tied up, takes about three to four weeks to make this commute, travel back and forth between the land of Canaan and the land of Egypt. And, they, and Joseph says, next time you return, you need to bring back your little brother Benjamin. See, Joseph's playing with a full hand. He understands their history. He knows their story. He recognizes his brothers. He knows about what's taken place in his homeland, where he's from. So they come back. And we see this third confrontation. They come back, they go into his house, and they're thinking they're about to be punished, thinking about they're about to be tortured. But what's Joseph do? He throws a feast for him. He gives five times the amount of food to his brother Benjamin. See, here's what I want us to capture. 
Joseph had a heart to restore. He had a desire to make that relationship better. As followers of Jesus, with any conflict that you have with people, your heart should be like Jesus, and Jesus' heart was to restore each and every one of us. Do you have a heart to restore with people you're struggling with? Do you have a heart to restore with a coworker? Do you have a heart to restore with that estranged family member? In his book, Caring Enough to Confront David Augsburg, professor at Fuller Theological Seminary, he coined this term, and I loved it, and it's kind of just penetrated my heart for many years. It says, care fronting. It's not about confronting, it's about care fronting. You confront because you care. You care about the relationship, you want to make it right, so you confront. It's not about being right, it's about making it right. It's about loving people, forgiving people. It's about speaking truth in a kind of way. It's about being heard, not being someone that is just saying, hey, I'm, 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 I'm going to hold my ground. It's sharing and say, let's strive for change. See, Joseph cared about his brothers who hurt him, who were frustrated with him, who were challenging and and. and and made him feel and her and go through so many trials in his life, but he cared for him. And I want to skip down to Genesis chapter 45, verses 1 through 8. Joseph's having these confrontations with his brother. Finally, he breaks. Joseph could stand it no longer. There were many people around in the room, and he said to his attendants, Out, all of you. So he was alone with his brothers when he told him who he was. And then he broke down and he wept. He was vulnerable. He wept so loudly the Egyptians could hear him, and the word quickly carried to Pharaoh's palace. I am Joseph, he said to his brothers. Is my father still alive? But his brothers were speechless. They were stunned to realize that Joseph was standing there in front of him. Please come closer. He said to them, so they came closer, and he said again, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into slavery in Egypt. But don't be upset. Don't be angry with yourselves for selling me to this place. It was God who sent me here ahead of you to preserve your lives. This famine that has ravaged the land for two years will last five more years, and there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. God has sent me ahead of you to keep you and your families alive and to preserve many survivors. So it was God who sent me here, not you. And it, he is the one who made me advisor to Pharaoh, the manager of his entire palace and governor of all of Egypt. Abraham had this covenant made with God that would say Father Abraham had, would have many generations come. It was Joseph who God used to preserve and to help the Israelite nation flourish. It was God's plan. What if so many times in our lives that we're going through conflict that needs confrontation, you might take a step back and say, God, this is your plan. Maybe you're developing my character. God, this is your plan. Maybe I I need to help for my future spouse. God, this is your plan. Maybe I, I need to figure this out to help navigate my kid who's wayward and who's maybe addicted, who's struggling. God, maybe this is your plan that I'm, I'm, I'm looking at some of these areas in my life that I just need to give over to you because right now I have everything white-knuckled grit. And maybe God's moving in your life in a way to say, hey, there's some things that need to be shaken up so that you can be in a place to have the healthy, best relationships possible. God, I feel lonely. No one sees me. God, no one cares for me. No one loves me. God, I'm in. And God's saying right here, I care for you. I love you. I see you. I acknowledge you. You're not forgotten. And maybe we need to take a step back when Joseph and look at his life, 13 years prison and slavery. Maybe we need to take a step back and say, whoa, look what he learned. 
Look what, how God moved. I think so many times in our lives, when it comes to this area of confrontation, we don't want to engage because we don't want to be so let down and disappointed. And God's saying, hey, learn through it. Plan through it. Be vulnerable and trust me through it. Maybe some of that confrontations with people, maybe some of that confrontations with decision, maybe some of that confrontation is with some past that you have to resolve. God's just saying, hey, come here. Jesus says, my, my yoke is light. I want to take that. Be vulnerable with me. Trust me. So today in this place, I don't know what you're dealing with. I don't know what you need to confront. I don't know what maybe needs to happen, needs to be fixed. But I'm, I do know this. When we read the story of Joseph, this man who gives us an ideal to live for, be vulnerable. Say, God, let me learn in this spot. Make a plan to move through it. Don't run from it. Don't avoid it. Say, God, I want to know you more. And confronting some of those things is essential is essential in our relationship to grow personally with God. So I want to pray over two groups of people. First, those in this place, you need to confront where you're spiritually standing at right now. If here in just a few minutes, Jesus comes, where would you be? Where would your eternity be? Your eternity be with Jesus in heaven or would it be far away from him? Maybe you need to confront a reality of your spiritual shape, of your spiritual moment, of your spiritual eternity. Maybe you're in here right now, you know there's some things you need to confront in your life, but you're avoiding it because you don't like conflict, you don't like the uncomfortability, you don't know how to make and have that conversation with people, and you're just avoiding it altogether. I'm praying right now through the power of the Holy Spirit that you have peace in your life, that you have the Holy Spirit leading you in your life, the Holy Spirit's guiding you in your life, that you can make the right decisions and have the correct discernment in your life. Church, we should be the best, most equipped group of people that can handle confrontation in a healthy way because the world is full of conflict. The world wants to throw stones. The world is not for us. The world is against us. But Jesus is always on our side. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we turn to you right now in this moment, and we say thank you. Thank you for confronting our conflict of, of sin. And Lord, there's those in this place right now that need to know you, need to meet you, need to experience a life full of grace and salvation by accepting you as their Lord leader. Lord, we pray for those bold steps. God, we pray that you protect them. We pray that you bless them. We pray that you help them and move them in the right direction to confront their eternity. Secondly, God, we pray for those who are going through some hurting situations right now and who need to confront the conflict in their life. God, confrontation is hard. But we've known you've gone through so much in order to make things new, to have a relationship with us, and we are grateful for that. So thank you for confronting us. Help us to exhibit what it means to follow you and let us confront as you would confront in every issue, every person, every place in our lives. In your great and holy name, we all say,